Ready Check Radio. What's up, Internet? It's Thursday at 7 p.m. Eastern. That means here on Ready Check Radio, it's time for the Relic Grind Final Fantasy XIV Square Enix podcast. And boy, is it square today. (laughs) (laughs) All right, we're going to do the show with one less host. Uh, My name is Mike Karn, a.k.a. Magic Man, as always. We do have quite a bit to talk about. Not a lot on the Final Fantasy XIV front, but of course there is... Always 14 drama, so we, of course, will cover that, uh, and we'll check where everybody is in the ultimate prog as well. If you're watching on YouTube or listening on Spotify, iTunes, any of the podcast platforms, thank you so much. We appreciate it. Give it a like, a thumbs up, all that fun stuff that feeds the algorithm and gets us in front of all of your friends and family. Thank you so much. We appreciate it. If you need to know where the socials are, Website's right there on the screen. If you're listening, it's readycheckradio, R-A-I-D-E-O dot com. And all the socials, as well as our backlog of shows, are on the site for you. Joining me to talk about all that fun stuff, Mr. Chris Montoya, a.k.a. Tarkoth. What's up? 20, carry the one. Yeah, okay. Sorry, um, I'm just adding up all the money I'd be giving Nintendo this year after that Nintendo Direct, so I'm just yeah, kind of tabulating yeah. that. I mean, not, and, and I figure... It, it, it wasn't as like Square Enix direct as yeah, the last one yeah. was, but it's there was true. some juicy good stuff on there. Yeah, and I figure you know Square really doesn't need my money, right? I'll just give it to Nintendo this year. I mean, the, Square's doing fine, right? Yeah, I, I'm pretty sure they're fine. <laughs> like, I wouldn't worry. Maybe about we'll anything talk about that. on that front. Yeah, I wouldn't worry about it. Also on the line, Mister Adam Lane. What's up, Kronos? Not much. Yeah, it was a pretty sweet direct. They even like shadow dropped. Well, they shadow dropped the game. I would rather the shadow dropped a different game, but yeah, Metroid, definitely. Metroid, Metroid was pretty cool too. So it mm-hmm. definitely was. I was like, oh my god, I want to get that, but I'm not gonna have time to play it for like the next week. So I'm just gonna wait and probably get the physical one that comes out like what the 22nd or something like that. Yeah, I don't remember the, what they said the date was. I think yeah, a lot of people it, even missed that they just put it digitally on the store. Yeah, yeah, yeah they they put it digitally on the store that. during <laughs> the presentation, the Metroid Prime remake. It was pretty dope. Uh yeah, it was it was good. And we'll we'll get to the direct because there was like one or two Square Enix things, one of which I'm gonna ask everybody if they've had a chance to check out yet. Kind of knew it was coming, but now it's here, so we'll get there. But let's start with just some uh 14 news because um one of the big headlines you may have seen making the rounds, and we did cover this on MMO Bomb 2. We were a little a little more dubious with uh, our headlines, uh only because you know, I, I kind of thought what was going on on this case, but you may have seen the headline that uh, said, "Hey, Square's you know finances were kind of weak." We'll get to that in a second. Final Fantasy fourteen not going to have an expansion until twenty twenty four, or not going to have an expansion this year uh, was kind of the phrase you maybe saw a little more of. You know, not going to have an expansion this year. Uh, and so initially, right, guys, like that may not seem all that surprising when you're kind of like, all right, we're only a couple of months. Normally, those announcements would start coming in as we lead into the fan fests, right? You mm-hmm. know, where we start to get just little bits and bobs, and obviously not the name or, or any new classes or anything like that. Those come in the 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 fan fests mm-hmm. typically. But we start to hear little bits and bobs about the next expansion. And we haven't heard any of that yet, so you can kind of step back and say, well, you know, it's February, we're only a couple months away. Maybe it is a little weird that I haven't heard anything on the next expansion yet, but it's not exactly late either. So eh, maybe maybe they meant fiscal year. Because remember, the fiscal calendar 2023 ends March 31st for Square Enix, right? Yeah. And so that means if an expansion came out in the typical time frame that it has basically every two years, um, sometime, let's say, in because obviously we had N. Walker delayed. So let's let's say somewhere between the end of October and mid-December, like that kind of month and a half range, then technically, I guess, that would not count as this year 
which is what they said in the investors' presentation. There would not be an expansion for either of their MMOs this year. So when you first saw the headline, Tark, and maybe didn't have a chance to look at the finance report or think about it a little bit, did you kind did you, did you kind of like, well, maybe I, I can expect that, and maybe we'll get one early 2024 then, or did you immediately look at the headline and go, something's wrong there, I feel like if we weren't getting an expansion at the end of 2023, we'd already know about that. Like Yoshi P <laughs> would be setting that up now so that there weren't disappointments at the fan fests. I, I mean, I feel like they've already set that up and the timetable like kind of bears that out. So my thought was, well, duh, like, why is this news that we're not going to get an expansion this year um, from a timetable per perspective? I'm like expecting 6.4 to be mid late May. I mean, 6.5 is late September, early October. And then I'm expecting like six months before the expansion comes out. Uh, so that would put it late March, maybe early April. So there's, there's your not in 2024 calendar and possibly not in 2024 or 2023 fiscal quarter. Um, their setup though, you can just point to the fan fest. Like they're not going to release the expansion before the Japanese fan fest, you know, ends, which is the last one that happens in February of next year. So there's no way we're not having, we're going to have a expansion, you know, so close to even the fiscal. So I I'm looking at April. So honestly, I got to say, I kind of agree with you. Like I looked at all those things and I was like, even if they meant calendar year, 2023 chronos, I'm actually not all that surprised by this. The only thing I am surprised by is that we heard it in the financial reports first and not from Yoshi P and team officially in some type of capacity. I think the patches themselves, having those extra couple of weeks does, of course, extend your timeline. So at some point, you are going to be thrown off of your typical two-year expansion cycle anyway, just mathematically, mm -hmm. with each, each of the patches taking a, a few extra weeks. Maybe it'd be this one, maybe it'd be the next one. Doesn't matter. But are, are you okay with that? If you look at things and you say, yeah, maybe early like Q2 of twenty calendar 2024, so uh, March, April, May-ish of 2024... Are you okay with that, given you know that we've kind of been down a little bit on recent patches and the amount of content and the spacing between them? Is there really enough? Because they said we're going to try to hold retention with some in-game, like if they didn't say events, but they said like campaigns and things like that. So I feel like they are going to add a little bit different stuff here and there that maybe they haven't done in the past to try and fill that gap a little bit. But is the audience at large going to be okay with an idea of a, you know, Q2 2024 expansion instead of a Q4 this year one? I don't think it's going to. I mean, th that was already my expectation. I think that's basically what Tarkov said. Like, like that was to me, this was like a big no news thing. Honestly, yeah. like I, I got messaged by it a lot. Well, like, it's about a news it. thing because they never said anything yeah. about it. And it slips I, I into it. the financial presentation, not an announcement from the and team, I think. They could have worded it a lot better, I think, in the financial presentation. Because I think that's people just read it word for word. And they're like, oh, there's no because I think the word for word, it even said like no expansion planned. Or something like that, which is just like and, and then obviously, I think they just meant fiscal year. Um. Yeah, I mean, I, I would probably even go later. I think it's probably going to be more like June-ish before we get the expansion. But You think we'd I, go nine months without an expansion? I, I think it's going to be a while. I really do. But, I mean, I, I, I would love it to be, just be April. I But, I mean, because I don't know, because uh, if the Japanese Fan Fest is in February, usually I feel like we yeah. wait a little bit longer than two months before an expansion comes out after the last right. Fan Fest. But maybe it'll be different this time. It's possible. Um, well, I mean, the fan fest schedule is different this time. It so, is. Yeah. yeah. You know, Absolutely. that's that's a, a something to take into consideration too. That sure. It's not the typical fan fest schedule. Now, Fanbyte did reach out to Square Enix to ask the exact question I kind of had looking at the the financial presentation. I mean, I write up finance. Hell, I just wrote up NCSoft's financial presentation the, today on on MMO Bomb. So I'm used to dealing with those, and everybody's got some variance in their calendars. Some use cal a calendar year, some use an arc year and financials. It, and Square's 
ends March 31st. So Fanbyte had the same question. Uh, and they took it to Square and said, hey, when you said this in your financial presentation to your investors, did you refer- were you referencing the calendar year 2023 when you said this year? Or were you referencing your financial year, which ends, uh, your financial 2023 ends on March 31st, 2023? And then they kick off financial 2024, April 1st. And Square Enix PR said to them, we were referencing the financial year. So not, I guess, totally closing the door for an expansion, quote unquote, on time at the end of the year here. But then you get into a really odd situation with those fan fests and an expansion kind of like dropping, as you pointed out, Tark, like in between things. Mm hmm. No, it it all makes sense from my point of view. I and mean, I think they're just all laid it out with their fan fest dates and just the patch cycles. I mean, you're, I mean the patch cycles, you got to add two weeks to everything, plus the extra week in the summer and week in the winter for their vacations to get away. Um, this is the new norm now. Like, it's going to be uh, two years plus like three, four months uh, between each expansion now. That's just going to be the way of the world, unfortunately. Yeah, Final Fantasy players, though, Kronos, have been spoiled by this yeah. almost oh, yeah. <laughs> clockwork delivery of content over an eight-year period, right? I mean, like clockwork. You could you could guess the dates. Not mm-hmm. just, hey, it'll come out in February, but you could guess the dates. That's going to be February 18th. Nah, that's going to be... And you could do it months ahead of time. Just looking at the in-game events, when they were set to end, okay, the patch will typically come X days after that, and before this, and the fan fests, and this. Of course, COVID throws a wrench in there as far as, like, scheduling around fan fests and things like that. Are people like us, are we're going to play anyway. Yeah. Most people, I would imagine, watching a podcast like this about Final Fantasy XIV are going to play anyway. But is the the population at large going to accept what will end up being, I would assume at minimum, if we're all kind of thinking around the same thing, a four to six month deviation from the typical two years get an expansion schedule. Yeah, I don't, I feel like the uh, more, I don't want to say casual because that's not really the right term, but I'll just use casual population. Um, I feel like they're probably already taking a break now. (laughs) Like, yeah, uh, and that yeah. and that's dangerous because we're talking about more time added now between yeah. today I, and the expansion. I would, and if be, the and if the patches come with the same relative amount of content that we're typically used to in all the dots, that yeah. is a big period of time. With it's we're already time. feeling it, where all three of us are like, okay, the last three weeks of a patch, we're off doing other things because we're just kind of done oh, yeah. with it, maybe checking in here and there. Although, if you want, if you want some time sinks, I got two ultimates that you can try. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so, uh, they'll, they'll take you a while, I promise. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, I mean, it, I would be interested to hear from someone from with that perspective because I don't have that perspective. My guess is like I don't think it will affect them that much because like I don't know if they'll notice those couple extra months like we would because we're gonna stay sub probably regardless, <laughs> and then just complain about having nothing to do. Um, whereas like, I think they're just going to take their break and just come back when Yoshi P announces whatever the date is. And then, you know, the servers get hammered and we can't log in, you know, another infinite loop that Final Fantasy has. Mm. Um, is it kind of the wrong, is it kind of the wrong time for this shift though, Tark? I mean, you kind of saw Final Fantasy 14 over the last, let's say two years, right? Maybe a little more, arguably not going to debate that with you. Sure. Three years. Uh, we kind of saw... You know, World of Warcraft and Final Fantasy crisscross, right? Yep. And the Final Fantasy really took advantage of a lot of things going right at the right time. Them and their consistent delivery of of good content and compelling story and expansions, all stuff they had control of, stuff they didn't have control of. World of Warcraft not being so well received the last few expansions and and hemorrhaging players and Activision, you know, people boycotting Activision because of various. Uh, lawsuits that were going on and then stuff even further outside of their control big time streamers Asmongold and stuff bringing more attention to a game that already had millions of eyeballs on it so let's not like 
he, he didn't build the game <laughs> or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Is this the wrong time to kind of, for lack of a better term, have to take your foot off the gas a little bit? Um, gosh, I don't, for the, maybe the health and well-being of their team, maybe it, it is the right time. Um, I know they have a bunch of project. Well, they at least have one big project that they've been working on the last, you know, two, three years. And that's the graphic overhaul that we're going to get with 7.0. Um, I, I just want to see that this extra time is going to lead to better and maybe some more content to fill in these these bigger gaps that we're seeing and that's um, so my far, concern i yeah, think so far we things like the, i think things like the graphic update and stuff like those while those are all welcome certainly mm -hmm. they are not a replacement for content but yeah. they when it comes to what's delivered but they are certainly a replacement for content chronos when it comes to what's developed mm -hmm. like the time is going into that and i'm we'll all love it but We'll be sitting here three weeks with a patch left or four weeks with a patch left saying, wow, it looks even prettier. And I still don't have anything to do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, like, you know, I guess if they announce the expansion and it looks different enough to the point where like it, they jump up, you know, like if it's like super noticeable yeah. and there's mm -hmm. like some big story overall, which I'm somewhat expecting. That might be big enough of a deal to make people forget about the fact that they probably just waited six to eight months. <laughs> Maybe. Um, but yeah, I, I can't disagree. Like, I think we've definitely seen less content. I don't mind it so much. I can find something to do in the game, but I totally get the, uh, I totally get it. It's definitely less and you're going to feel you, it even more. And when you do have breaks. the argument of, yeah, people like us are always going to be subbed. Yeah. We're always going to be subbed. Uh, and, and you said that Kronos, we're always going to be subbed. Uh, but the vast majority of your player base may not be. And I think the the longer you stay away from the game because the content gets spaced out a little more and maybe the content's just as good and you'd still love doing it, it's mm. very easy to not come back, isn't yeah. it? No, yeah. yeah, yeah. That could be a problem. Retention for that, you know, those people could be an issue. It's definitely possible. It's interesting to see. Like, I wasn't surprised by any of it. I did have the initial... What, were they talking about fiscal or calendar? Because this was a presentation to investors on the fiscal year. And they confirmed a fan bite that they did. And then even when I saw that, I was like, yeah, but I still don't think we're getting expansion later this year. <laughs> like, yeah, no. I, I still just don't see it. It'll be interesting to see. What also is interesting to see is the absolute implosion of G-Shade in the community. Just unreal. Un real people mad so yeah people <laughs> mad tark what the hell's going on here um apparently there was this mod called g shade i don't i don't use any mods i'm a ps5 guy you know ps5 master race here uh so i don't worry about mods because i can't use them anyways but you know there's this g shade mod and it makes your graphics look prettier and apparently this uh the guy that's uh created it uh, for final fantasy 14 i guess or is it just a mod in general well g shade is kind of it's been its own system yeah it's its own it's its own version of reshade right okay. made okay. made for for final fantasy gotcha. uh in, in general but yeah, yeah and, and all of it we've talked about it on the show before like all of us and in most of the community just kind of looks at it as a very harmless mod right it's one of the yeah. ones we always use as an example when we're talking about yeah if you had to make if you're square and you had to make a fine line of black and white this mod would generally be acceptable to use it is sure. changing the visual presentation of the game to you yeah, bubbles, yeah. not yeah not doing doing other things but I think a real quick way to piss off a community is to do what happened here, huh? Yeah, don't don't don't, don't put your ma don't put malware, don't put little stuff, don't don't mess with your mods to uh, you know put weird stuff on people's computers. Uh, people don't like that. They they frown upon that and they look for other avenues to maybe go. So yeah, this guy uh, got kicked in the teeth recently uh, on social media. <laughs> Yeah, a full directions on how to drop G Shade on and and outlets saying that that support modding in Final Fantasy 15, regardless of what the terms of service say, saying we're no longer going to support this one anymore. 
the gist of it was, and this is from the, their Discord, an anti-tampering function was added to G-Shade's installer to trigger restarts in the event that a third party external software or library utilized the G-Shade's installer functions without actually running it in a clandestine fashion. Anti-tampering code is not unusual in proprietary software, which is true. A restart was chosen specifically because it is harmless, but slightly more noticeable than a quick process kill. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this function was impossible to trigger by running the G-Shade installer as normal end user in any fashion, uh, as a normal end user in any fashion, but has now been removed after extensive feedback from the community. Uh, too little, too late, I would imagine, though, Kronos, based on what we're seeing. Yeah, everybody that I know that uses it has moved on to other things wow. because of this. So I... This is I don't use this, so I'm thankful that I don't. <laughs> uh, I so, I did it one time. I I told uh, you about that last last show, I think. Yeah, but G shade I, like I don't know, like just making my stuff. Like, I mean, it does look nice, but I've just never really cared. I'm more I care more about my game running consistent frame rate and like sure. that kind of stuff than I care about some shadows on the ground. Um, but I can't I can't deny that it made it look the game look nicer and it was good for people that do like G pose. But I'm glad they found an alternative already that seems to be better so i hope that sticks around it doesn't come to something like this but yeah it's pretty pretty terrible <sighs> and if you just, just need kind of a prank thing right it was like no no the, like... the the creator had issues with another uh software suite kind of bastardizing some g-shade files for its own gotcha. use so that it didn't have to do things and so this was kind of snuck in there as a way to deal with that. And and they're yeah. not lying. If you read their statement, it's generally your average end user just using G-Shade is never, ever going to see this. Uh, yeah. And it's, it's never, ever going to happen. But it doesn't just kill the process. It performs an entire restart. That's noticeable. And that means you have put something in the code that is literally monitoring what I have running and can impact the performance or mm. the powering on or off of my item, and you didn't put it in the patch notes or anything. All it, it this could have totally been avoided by like two extra lines in the patch notes. Implemented an anti blah blah blah. If using a blah blah blah, will trigger computer restart. And mm. you know you wouldn't have the you would still have blowback of people using G Shade saying now I don't feel comfortable using G Shade I don't want to use it even though I'm not going to be impacted by this knowing that it's monitoring things, but you wouldn't have what also happened in this situation. Tark the almost you very sneakily did this and didn't tell anybody. Yeah, I'm so glad I'm a PS5 player. <laughs> I don't have to deal with that bullshit. <laughs> And then you bring you bring it all back to our discussion last week, right, Kronos? To I can't imagine why Square Enix has tried to stay out of this ball field <laughs> forever. Oh, yeah, if they do it, they would get severe backlash. It's just the yeah. only way they'd be able to like truly monitor. Yeah. Um, but I don't think they'll ever do it because I mean, this is what would happen, and you would affect more than just the small subset of the raid community. You would affect. I mean, this probably this right here probably affected more people than the world first stuff did. Oh, no doubt. Yeah. Um, yeah. So that that should tell you everything you need to know about what are the most popular. Third See, I think long term, us. though, Square Enix would be fine with like an anti cheat or something that was broadly communicated the way it should be. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about more like them not wanting to get into the mod space, Tark, and, and be like, sure. these are oh, good ones. Yeah. These are bad ones. Like this is a perfect example of why Square Enix would and any company would be super hesitant to put their thumbprint on any mod and say, this one's cool to use, and then in the next update have something like this happen, and Square Enix is the yeah. one saying, we support using that mod. Yeah, I mean, you know, you take the the two biggest MMOs, Final Fantasy XIV, they're, they're on the one end of the spectrum, absolutely no mods, but, you know, just don't tell us or whatever. And then you have World of Warcraft, yeah, yep, mods are okay, but they can't, like, they have to develop around it for their content. Like, neither of them are, like, we, we need to, like, manage which ones. Like, neither of them, like, no, it's either all or nothing. So Weren't there weren't there <laughs> interviews, though? I think right before Shadowlands came out, maybe. Maybe it was Ian Hezekostas, and maybe I'm just remembering it wrong. But I feel like there were interviews where they did bring up, because World of Warcraft, not too long ago, I think it was right before Shadowlands came out, um, had to do a kind of a revamp of their API and scale back 
a lot of what mods could do because they were getting gotcha. ridiculously powerful. And in an interview, I seem to remember one of them saying something like, you know, maybe if we go back in time, the the, the option to do this stuff, maybe maybe we don't do it. <laughs> like, yeah, he, he, he did say that. Yeah, I remember that, too. You know, it, was, it was Ian. I think it was Ian. Was it, was it Ian? I thought so. Well, I believe so. Well, I don't know, man. Whew. And uh, one last piece, and I think we actually talked about this last week. I know we've talked about it before. I just thought it was neat. Game Rant put up an article written by Eric Law uh, this week with the headline, Final Fantasy XIV's classes are slowly losing their identity. And I was like, huh, I wonder who's been saying that for a while on, on the show. Now, I may not agree with mm -hmm. all of Eric's particular arguments as proof of this, but we, all three of us, have talked about the concept of when you start balancing to the degree that Final Fantasy uh, has balanced, particularly for the PvE side of things, and not wanting any particular job excluded from a, a raid because of performance in any type, then the rotations start to feel a little similar, and the classes start to behave in a similar fashion, and a black mage doesn't feel all that different from another ranged magic user, you know, and... Uh, besides these extra two or three buttons that you you randomly use. And Eric basically puts forth the same argument f for the same key reasons. But does point out, Kronos, I think an interesting point, that on the PvP side of things, you don't really feel that. <laughs> like know, because right? Because of the little kits, there is a little bit more... Not a lot because it is by role, right? Mm -hmm. But differentiation between the classes there than we get in PV, uh, PVE. It see, I, I think you can't. It's hard to make that comparison because it's almost like two different games a little, in, a, in a way. Even though you're playing oh, the same, out. even though you're playing the same jobs, because when you balance, like say, like a fighting game, right? You don't want every fighter to feel the same, but there's all these intricate things where, like, one class fights another class and that's very different than another class whereas like in pve we're all fighting the same enemy right right yep so exactly that's it. why that's why the comparison is very hard to make so like you can have these pvp classes be very diverse because of the intricacies when they fight against other players it's different than fighting like an enemy and you can still balance it and have all the classes feel unique and fun but when pve comes into play people's brain and i think he mentions this in the article a lot of people are just going to try to figure out whatever the most optimal thing is. And you'll have that in PvP too, but there's more arguments and like to be had of like what's best in PvP. And because there's compositions and there's all these other things, there's all these other layers that don't exist in PvP in PvE. PvE is just like what class works around this fight the best and who does the most damage. And people are going to just like gravitate to those. And as long as the difference between the top and the bottom is relatively minimal, you're not going to hear like a lot of balance complaints. Whereas in PvP, there's so many other variables, which is why I think that compared, like I've heard people say like, oh, we should just make the PvP stuff in PvE. It just doesn't, you can't do that. <laughs> it wouldn't work. Um, and I've always been like, yeah, the, the jobs are getting very homogenized for sure. It's definitely a valid complaint. But me personally, I'd rather have the jobs be balanced, play slightly different and fun. And my content is good. Like I'd rather the fights be yep. good. That's just my personal stance. I'm not saying that's like the end all be all. There's definitely no. an argument to be had. And homogenization is a very real issue. Um, mm -hmm. Because, I mean, if you look at it, like, I wouldn't consider myself an expert in certain jobs, but if you play like one role, it's not that hard to move it within the role because of how right. similar True. they are. True. So yeah. I, I looked forward to the end of the article because we've talked about how do you get around that, Tark? Like, what could you do? Theoretically, what do we think Square Enix would even be willing to do? What what is totally off the table when it just comes to the way they develop and stuff like this? So I was looking forward to the end of the article when I saw there was a how to preserve class identity in Final Fantasy 14 section. And it was four paragraphs. And I was like, oh, okay. Maybe Eric's got some cool ideas we haven't talked about. I'll bring him to the show and and we'll talk about those too. And then I read the four paragraphs. And I don't know about you, maybe this is just me, uh, the first three paragraphs didn't really say anything as far as how they yeah, could no. <laughs> fix it. The last paragraph kind of alludes to more a more conceptual, you know, or ethereal thing. 
Final Fantasy XIV needs to stop itself from sliding into monotony for the sake of balance. While balance is important in PvE activities, it can't come at the cost of fun, or else players will lose interest in the game and eventually quit. This will require Final Fantasy XIV to strike a balance between its PvE design philosophy and its PvP kits. If it can inject the personality and uniqueness from PvP job actions into future PvE job changes, 14 can prevent its gameplay play loop from becoming too monotonous. And then I was kind of disappointed with the the end of the article. I thought Eric wrote a great piece, but I, I just didn't like the conclusion. You, you have this big buzz header, like, how do you fix this? And it basically was like, well, Square's just got to be um, not you know thinking so much about balance, but thinking a little more about fun and yeah, find the balance between those two. And I was like, ugh. No, no, uh, no. <laughs> That's, I think uh, I think balance has to come first. Um, you want all your jobs to be viable, um, especially when you have a system where one character can be everything. You know, having a job that's just not used because it's just not good in the content uh, is a, a big downside. And then I, I brought up WoW previously, but I'm bringing it back here. I remember in Shadowlands, like seeing DPS meters in raid content, you know, you'd have the fire and arc mages, you know, up near the top. And then you see fury and arms warriors way down the bottle bottom, like a third of their DPS. And yeah. it's just not viable. You, you know, those, those skill trees are not viable in any way. You don't bring them. Um, they final fantasy does not want that. So balance for them comes first. Um, the fun comes second. And then they have to worry about homogenization I'm wondering maybe, you know, with that last paragraph, if a level squish will also bring a ability squish too. We're going to have so many fewer abilities with a level squish that it kind of brings it more in line with the PVP kits because they're just, everything's boiled down into a few buttons. If that maybe is a solution short term uh, for Final Fantasy XIV coming expansions. Is that an option though, Kronos? We literally just had that a stat squish and, and an ability squish. squish. There was a moderate ability squish too that came along with that. Yeah, yeah I guess. I mean, yeah, I think they're always going to. Yeah, they're always going to be tinkering with like abilities. I'm sure you'll see some get removed. I don't know how many, because I mean, yeah, I mean, hot bar space is a real thing, especially you know going to the PS5 thing. Like people need to be able to fit their stuff on those controller hot bars. Yeah. So you can't. You have to swap between four of them. <laughs> yeah, you can't really get past that point. I mean, Astro is probably pushing the limit right now. And, like, the funny thing is, is Astro is probably one of the more unique jobs in the game. I mean, right? Um, so it's kind of, it's it's interesting. I I don't have an answer for it, but I'm not the one writing articles about it, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. And I and I obviously have some, some bias and some preference. But um, I would like to see them be a bit more unique, but I don't want them to be, get to the point where like Tark said, we're like shunning things out. And that's, I think that's bad design. I think when you have skill trees like you have in WoW, you're just creating incorrect decisions for the player, in my opinion. Well, that's also the thing, though, that WoW and, and other MMOs do, does a little differently, right? Yeah. In Final Fantasy XIV, a Black Mage is a Black Mage. Right. And so yeah. if there is a not viable build of Black Mage, that means Black Mage is just not viable. Uh, right. It's not like we have the ability to say, I'm going to build my black mage as a fire specialist. I'm going to build my black mage as an ice specialist. And you know what? This patch fire does better. So I'll keep that loadout saved so that when I'm raiding, I'll switch to fire real quick. But I really like playing ice in the other content. That's just not that's not Final Fantasy. Right. No. Where no. WoW has and other MMOs have been able to maybe ostracize a particular build of a class here and there on particular patches because you can still be a mage. You like a mage? There's three different core skill sets for you to put your points into, or now two, I think. But you build it out like that. And literally, WoW went from having multiple skill trees to condensing things a lot, where you're just picking a couple abilities, to now going back to those skill trees in the latest expansion. We don't have that flexibility because a black mage is a black mage. And here's your black mage abilities and your stats are all so, the same. The gear is what's going to differentiate your stats. That's it. I, I think my thing is, is like you, when you say the word flexibility, it's true to the extent. But to me, I just feel like they're giving the players wrong decisions technically. Like 
I don't like if if it depends on your goal in the game, I guess, right? Like everybody's definition but of fun is different. Can you're you're right though. Like can you make a bad build? Of course. But yeah. they I don't think I wouldn't agree with you that like one choice is correct and one is wrong absolutely. Oh because no. Because you may poor, build yeah. you may build, hey, this particular raid fight or hard dungeon fight or mythic or whatever the hell you're running. Um DPS is king. And my DPS is higher as a fire mage, let's say. I don't know what builds in WoW are the strongest right now. I haven't played in a long time. This is just an example. Right. This one is going to, this encounter that we're going to do is really dependent on crowd control. And you know what? I'm better as an ice mage with crowd control abilities. Like the builds can be flexible. That's where I'm talking about the flexibility coming in. Not just, is there going to be an ideal build for just, I want to do everything mediocre yeah. and not be great at anything? Yes, here is the stat calculator. Fill it out. But having the flexibility to be like, okay, it's not as important that I do DPS during this fight. I got to be doing other things. I'm going to rock this loadout instead. Yeah. That's a cool feature that we just don't have in, if, in 14. It, yeah, if that's a valid decision making thing in WoW, then yeah, that's cool. As long as it's like worth it to do and there's like a valid decision to be made. I guess my worry is... Yeah, and don't ask me to do. tell you whether or not it's valid right now. Yeah. I, I wouldn't know. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, just hypothetically, <laughs> right? I mean, I, I get where you're coming from. It's just, I, I just feel like when you when you make something that dynamic, you're just really opening it up to, like, people making the worst decisions. <laughs> and, like... Oh. oh, for that, see uh, Elder Scrolls Online. Like... <laughs> oh, yeah, see, I, don't know, I, don't know any, I don't know anything about that, so if that's that bad, then I... Oh, yeah, sorry, Elder but, Scrolls, yeah. you could totally jank your character... I'll have to take you on a tour sometime when we're just hanging out at night. So many options. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you could totally just make an ass jank character not good at anything and have to be like, well, I got to farm up some gold to respec. <laughs> yeah, it feels bad. Uh, okay, that's going to do it for Final Fantasy fourteen chat. We're going to leave that topic. Uh, let us know in the comments what you think of uh, G Shade or the expansion, you know, looking like it's going to be a 2024 thing, even though Square clarified and said that they were speaking of the fiscal year. We still kind of believe anyway it's going to be 2024. Do you? Let us know in the comments below. Like and subscribe while you're there. Let's head over and talk about some other Square Enix stuff. I feel like, gents, I forgot to put something in the show notes. Like, I, what am I forgetting? I oh, was like looking forward to this show. I was like, there's going to be a lot of news. This is going to be a good show. It's probably yeah. going to run over an hour. We're going to have some extra stuff to talk about. I feel like I for I forgot to put something in the notes. Um, wasn't there supposed to be like this whole rumored thing? Wasn't oh, there a rumor yes. stream? Yes. It was a rumor stream. Yes. Supposed Did to be the that? 35th anniversary. I it was supposed to be uh, the 7th. I, 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 if it happened, I didn't see it. Did you guys see it? I thought we is, were all gonna is, live. Yeah, Did we all just yeah, like new, it? newest girl is ten three confirmed. Maybe it uh, just got delayed. Just imaginary maybe. delayed. It's delayed. fine. It's yeah, imaginary yeah. delayed. Haven't heard word one it's about any presentation, let alone this particular presentation. It's, it's uh scheduled for February thirtieth now. <laughs> Not this fiscal year. <laughs> Not this fiscal year. <laughs> Sad. <laughs> Well, in place, we did have the Nintendo Direct, as we kind of mentioned at the top of the show. And there wasn't a whole lot of Square Enix stuff. There was a lot of some cool stuff. But kind of like the biggest, uh, really the only Square Enix thing was Octopath Traveler 2 getting a demo. And you can carry your progress over. Something that we have seen Square do more and more with titles. I talked about my experience with Theatrhythm uh, Final Bar last week. Has anybody played the Octopath Traveler 2 uh, demo? I have not yet. Uh, I did not play it, but I watched my boy Piers uh, start Oswald, so I got some good hands-on viewing with that. Um, it's definitely Octopath Traveler. Uh, it's gorgeous. Well, that's good. I mean, I, I feel <laughs> like that's I feel like that's a good starting point. When I, when I when I say that, I mean like the 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 combat. The combat is you know he booted it up. Sure small. as shit, it said Octopath Traveler two yeah. on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> it's always good when you download something that you know you're getting what you download. <laughs> um the, the battle system is you know typical bravely default you know octopath traveler um it's gorgeous they're taking this hd 2d 3d you know uh system and and they're just pushing the limits on it it's absolutely gorgeous the music is totally fitting for the the setting that's it, it's in 
and the voice acting is top notch as well. Um, I was fully engaged on what I was seeing, so it's it's looking great. I need to play the first one. Nice. Yeah, you definitely need to play the first one. <laughs> but instead, you went to Final Fantasy 15 on your streams. <laughs> yeah, perfect opportunity to have started Octopath Traveler. But no, you were like, I'm gonna hang with the bros. Have you never yeah. played 15? Uh, I got to Titan the first time, and, and it's been years. Um, okay. So diving back in, gonna finish it. It'd be good. Now, speaking of Square Enix's financial thing uh, earlier with the Final Fantasy XIV stuff, I kind of separated this bit out, the actual financial bit of it, uh, because it wasn't exclusively fourteen stuff. But let's just say, gang, that Square Enix did not have a wonderful, wonderful financial report for uh, for twenty twenty two. They did not. Uh, sales were down 6.6% year on year. Operating income was down 17.6% year on year. That's operating income. Operating income. Uh, you will see if you're like kind of looking at the, the chart I have there, I've pulled some snippets of it, that you'll see that there's a, a quite a bit of growth in that Q1 through Q3 column uh, for the profit attributable to owners of parent uh there is a 46.3 in that column a 46.3 that is a uh, positive change of 6.5 when you see everything else in parentheses or at zero <laughs> in that changes column that is your sale of crystal dynamics idos montreal and all of those things for 300 million to Embracer. So that is the profit attributable to the parent. That category up uh, for the uh, fiscal year ending March 31st, 2023. But um, that's about it. Net sales down. Operating income down. Operating margin down. And this is year over year comparison. So compared to what they did last year, now obviously thinking about this logically, Kronos. There's probably a good reason for some of these, right? When, you, when you're doing a year-over-year -year comparison, what did Square have coming out last year? And what did they have coming out this year? You can kind of just look at those two lineups and go, well, yeah, I would expect you'd be down. Yeah, yeah, it's hard to be an expansion year. It's, I mean, and that's just on the MMO side of things. Yeah, I mean, this next coming... That, that doesn't count, you know, Guardians of the Galaxy or like any of those other big things that maybe they didn't think they were as successful as they could be. Uh, I was told Outriders. They, they, did, they yeah. did not meet expectations. Yeah. Line near near not. Replicant, Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy and Outriders. Even if they didn't meet Square's expectations, can you name anything Square put out this year that you think off the top of your head would have beaten one of those three sales-wise? Babylon's uh, Fall. <laughs> whatever. That's my point. Oh. Like... Even if you take what is generally probably, you know, let's say Nier is a little niche and Outriders had its ups and downs, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy did, I think, better than both of those two. But let's say Outriders was the worst of those three. Can Ooh. you name something Square released this year uh, that sold, that, and you're guessing off the top of your head, sold better for them than Outriders? Crisis Core would be my guess. Yeah, but that wasn't part of the because it was that one wasn't part three, of right? this. Yeah, 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 yeah. Orders one through three. Um, triangle strategy. Well, no, no, no. Um, that that would count, but just barely. So we probably aren't seeing a huge okay. impact from Crisis Core because Q one okay. through Q three would take uh, Square Enix's calendar through December thirty first. That's okay. And that came out what December twenty eighth. Has been I think? enough time to sell all the yeah, units. Like yeah, sell. so it would be on there for a couple days worth of sales. Yeah, yeah. I mean, maybe Triangle Strategy, like Dark just mentioned. Uh, I could see that. But other than that, not, Maybe. not I mean, really. I mean, strategy games are still kind of niche, though. Like Valkyrie. Oh, they are know. niche. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Star Ocean. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't see anything that. that's that's yeah. triple A. And, then you, the and then you stack it on the point that you already made, Kronos, which in the MMO side of things, this was the off year, right? If, if mm. we were following traditional last eight years calendars. This was yeah. the off year. No, no expansion for Final Fantasy XIV. And in this case, no expansion for Dragon Quest X as well. Uh, smartphone and browser games, weak performance of existing titles. A lot of uh, games as a service closing down 
failing to reach the the stuff that they had last year and then closing down this year. We talked about that on the set on, on the show before. In the financial presentation, Square says that they have multiple new titles planned, including a, a featuring a new IP. Uh, while no expansions are planned for the MMO segment, in the short term, the company will focus on retaining users through a variety of operational initiatives. And as for browser and smartphone games, the company has additional titles for slated for launch in Q4 and beyond. Now, if you have to pull out all the way to March 31st to get a look at their total financial year, it's not going to be a good year. If these are the oh, results okay. already, maybe they're going to get a bump off Crisis Core, okay? Yeah. You, I think we all agree that that's probably going to sell reasonably well. Forspoken just does not seem to be lighting the world on fire performance or sales-wise. Even people who like it are like, yeah, it's, an, it's a mediocre average RPG that you can have some fun in. It's nothing earth-shattering. It's not going to break sales records or anything. And then that puts us up against the end of March. And you do have some odds and ends in here, Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy Theat Rhythm and stuff like that. But once we hit March 31st and the year closes, I think you're going to find a company that leaned itself up by selling some Western stuff is having a down sales year compared to the previous year. The future looks optimistic in Final Fantasy 16 and down the road a 14 expansion. But I think you're going to find a company rife are ripe to be sold, right? Like, just buy us. Sell off more assets. Uh, <laughs> Maybe. They're going to have to sell off Enix at this rate. It's just going to be square. I, I don't know. I think I think this next fiscal year, even if there's no expansion, which I don't think there's going to be in the next fiscal year. Uh, yeah, it would have to come out before March 31st, 2024 I, to be part of the same fiscal year as FF16. Which is doubtful. But having 16 and Rebirth in the same year That's should huge. be a pretty big boon, huge. I think. That's also, another huge. game we forgot, The Strangers of Paradise probably attributes to some of that stuff from this past year, too. I feel like that game was relatively yeah. popular. So. Uh, taking a look here just at the sales by regions, uh, North America and Europe taking the bulk of the sales. So kind of obvious to see why even though they they kind of make very Japanese oriented decisions sometimes, and we kind of like, why aren't you bringing this here? Or why aren't you bringing this here? Uh, their want desire to at least want to continue to cater to a Western market, even though they've sold their Western developers, you could certainly see why, right? Just I mean, looking at their their financial report, it is absolutely the lion's share of of the money is coming from North America and Europe. <sighs> I don't know, man. I think you think I think you buy into the dip short term. Uh but let let's talk again at the beginning of 2024. <laughs> <laughs> I think that'll be a good time to reconvene cuz I mean you'd probably be coming off of yeah. uh 7 part 2 I would imagine or 7 rebirth yep. at that point. Yep. Yup. So, yeah. New titles including a new IP. We'll see. And NFTs. Go NFTs. <laughs> <laughs> uh boy oh i i'm sorry i had this tab open for final fantasy 14 i know this may not apply to many people watching this show but if it does hi and we appreciate you watching uh or listening uh final fantasy 14 housing development put on hold for chaos and light data center worlds right now um obviously uh the the reason behind the decision is the massive earthquake in in turkey or our thoughts with Everybody impacted there. But Final Fantasy fourteen. if you have a house, you don't have to worry about auto demo on the Chaos and Light data center worlds. Uh, for right now, they're shutting that off. Just in case that applies to anybody watching. Uh, okay. Speaking of Forspoken, they, uh, they tweeted the following out, which I find interesting. This is a message yeah. from LumaPro ENs. Uh, Takishi uh, Haramaki on the upcoming on upcoming updates for Forspoken. And this is the head of studio and director for the game. Uh, thank you to all the players who have enjoyed Forspoken and enjoyed Athia since launch. We've been listening to all your feedback and are hard at work on an upcoming patch that will include improvements to overall performance, graphics, playability, and general updates and fixes to the game content across PS5 and various PC hardware configurations. We're committed to making Forspoken the most enjoyable experience possible, and we'll provide an update about the timing of the next patch as soon as possible. We appreciate your continued support and patience. Obviously, great news for, for Spoken fans. 
who are having some performance issues on their PS5 and on their PC. That's great news. Uh, and maybe I'm reading too much into this because I, you know, I write for the industry. Um, I always feel a little bit worried when a game this close to release has to restate that it's committed to the game or feels <clears throat> like they have to restate that they're committed to the game. Like that, that entire thing really didn't, we're committed to making Forspoken the most enjoyable experience possible. Uh, this just came out. I, maybe I'm reading too much into it, Tuck. I just <laughs> find it weird. Whole, this whole thing just give you cyberpunk vibes, like all the delays and the way it's released and the state it's in. You're like, I mean, it's playable, but I mean, ugh, I mean, <laughs> and the team has to put out these these JPEGs of, of letters that they're putting out every so often saying, yeah, we're, we're still going with this. It's, it, trust us. Stay with us. And I'm like, like I, I just feel like anytime, anytime any company says we're totally committed to X, okay, it immediately tells me they're getting pressure and they want to oh, yeah. publicly express how committed they are to the game so that you as fans and players will feel it's safe to then also be committed to the game to get the pressure off of them. When you do it this close to launch, Kronos, it makes me even a little more like, mm, mm. or I'm reading too much into it, and they just said, hey, we want you to know, we're committed to making this the best product we can. And, and it's just as simple as that. They didn't mean anything by it. I felt kind of the same way as you when I read this, honestly. Uh, I don't. I didn't buy the game, so... It just newest girl says this team is cooked after the season pass content <laughs> is done. In my opinion, I mean, I feel like it's it's looking kind of rough. It, maybe they're lucky and they'll have some kind of cyberpunk resurgence. That would be good for them. I mean, cyberpunk ended up like, that's going to require an later. anime. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, maybe, I mean, maybe that's <laughs> the plan. I don't know. Yeah, that's going to require an anime. But that I'm interested. Wonders. I, 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 I've <laughs> seen people that are enjoying it. Yeah. Um, so it is kind of sad that I feel like most of the stuff I hear is relatively negative um i yeah, don't most of the I'm stuff i hear up. isn't positive or negative it's just like i'm enjoying it yeah but, it's like yeah, a, it's man. an average game yeah yeah and i talked to a couple people that seem to really like it i just yeah i mean i guess my gut tells me like i don't think they're gonna make another one of these but i you know for those people i hope i'm wrong i just gotta say square maybe if you weren't just so crazed on making everything a freaking games as a service you'd sell mm. more copies of more solidly put together games that you spent some time on like i don't know maybe it's just i know me. It's i know crazy. we all yearn there's... for the days of no you know, can it's a game, just there's can a game come out complete and and no patches well yeah but there's always just like you, you look at live service games it's like there's only so much time and money that i have <laughs> right i can't yeah. possibly play all the ones that i think are cool like even the ones i absolutely think that's the coolest game in the world i'll sub to it and play it or i'll buy their season pass and play it i can't possibly do that Financially or time wise. And then when one company is making like a dozen of them, oversaturation <laughs> like, is swear, a problem come on. at that point. Oh, one hundred percent. It already is. Yeah. Hey, happy birthday, Aerith. Uh her birthday was February seventh, so just a few days ago. Uh happy birthday to Aerith. So I took the liberty. The I took the liberty of pulling up Final Fantasy birthdays. And I didn't put this in the show notes for you, but Kronos, month and day, you don't have to give me the year. What's your birthday? April 11th. April 11th. Do you know if you share a Final Fantasy birthday with any Final Fantasy characters? I don't, honestly. So April 11th, exactly, you don't. But there is one Final Fantasy character born in April that has not been given an official day as far as Lauren. And keep in mind... Most Final Fantasy games, while birthdays have been referenced and specific dates have been referenced in, in very few, uh, m for the most part, they aren't. These all come from like them square fleshing out the lore and other right. things, you know, stuff like that. But we don't know uh, what Beatrix's birthday is from FF9, but we do know it's in April. Okay. We do so know it it's could in be, April. Could be the 11th. We don't know. Could yeah. be. The closest be. to you is uh, you have Gal. On April fifth, that's terrible. All right, next <laughs> and well, next one's not much better. <laughs> you have uh, Gray Edwards 
from the spirits within. <laughs> Which one was that? Which person was that? Uh, he was the <laughs> one voiced by Alec Baldwin. Okay, okay. Yeah, I don't remember any other names. <laughs> That's on April 15th. So let's just hope Beatrix's birthday is the 11th for you because okay, Beatrix yeah. is definitely a cool. Or at character. least closer range. Maybe like, right. yeah. I'm February 12th. I don't have, oh, there is a note too, by the way. Um, this is according to the fandom, uh, Final Fantasy fandom, because Diamond is the birthstone for April representing strong will. The developers of Final Fantasy 15 chose April as the birth month for characters who fit that description. So like Gladiolus, Gladiolus uh, is in there. Arden's in April. So, you know, but yeah. Uh, mine, is, I don't share an exact birthday. I'm February 12th. Uh, on February 13th is nine from uh, uh, Type Zero. So not much better on my side there. If I go back a day or two, it's Deuce from Type Zero. Oh, but also Setzer. And now what I can deal with, because I feel go. like That's Setzer and I, out. as gamblers and playing with dice and cards and just, yeah, yeah. I feel like Setzer and I would be bros. I feel yeah. like we would be bros. Tark, what's your birthday? Anyone? Oh, hold uh, on. The lady, uh, newest girl, wants to know 10th of February today. Uh, no, nobody today. Setzer on the 8th. Or to 10th is tomorrow. 10th is tomorrow. Is your birthday tomorrow? My birthday is Sunday. Uh, Tark, what month and day? What do you got? April first. If they put anybody no with a birthday shit. there, like no, but you got someone April second. <laughs> okay, that's you got someone stuff, April second. You got Gladiolus, who I already mentioned, is April second. Uh, okay, and uh, Wait, Gareth okay. Barrington from uh, Final Fantasy Tactics nice. uh, okay. is is also on April second as well. April second as well. Baron Vagavon. Now I'm gonna just look up everybody's in here. Chat, uh, Baron Vagabond says May 5th. I'm going to assume that's Baron's birthday. Not the 5th, but you got the 3rd, Miss Tifa Lockhart, baby. And the 9th, Somnus Lucius Callum from uh, Final Fantasy 15. All right. The Founder King. The Founder King. So, yeah, happy birthday. Uh, also, from the Final Fantasy VII Twitter account, I thought this was kind of neat, too. I mean, it's only, what, 25 years after the fact. Uh, but we do find out that they were telling like little stories on the remake Twitter. And one of them was in the early stages of development, Cloud was supposed to be a berserker whose left arm was sealed by a bracelet. And when the seal was broken, he'd be able to use both arms to power up. In addition, there was also an initial setting that the sword on his back is attached with a magnet. <laughs> so we're finally getting questions answered. He was supposed to be a berserker, and it was attached with a magnet in initial settings and stuff like that. So there we go. I feel Mysteries. like the magnet thing is actually like how that works, though. And oh, yeah. That's how I imagined it in my head. Because, because yeah, oh, we all did. We all imagined it in yeah, our I, head. I just, so like with Zach. Like in late in games that are actually like animated better, and I guess even in the remake now too. Like when Zach puts it on his back, you hear like a a click. sound yeah. click. that sounds like it's like clicking into place. So I just always assumed it was I, a magic. I did too. I did too. Playing Final Fantasy VII back in the day, yeah, on the PlayStation One, I did. Let's uh, head over and do love it or leave it. Love it or leave it is the way we end every episode of The Relic Grind here. It's where I give you something Square Enix related. Could be something they did, a feature in a game, a game itself, something they did a press re release, or something just tangentially related to Square Enix that I feel like talking about. And you tell me whether you love it, want more of it, or you leave it, never want to see it again. Gentlemen, today I want to talk about something that you love. We'll leave it on the love side of things. And how is it Square Enix related? Because specifically, it's not allowed to be a Final Fantasy. I want to know about your favorite non-Final Fantasy RPG that you just love, Tark. I'll go to Kronos first. <laughs> what, did I surprise you with show notes given to you 24 hours in advance that just, told you I was going to ask this no, question? I, still, I have so many RPGs I love. I just, I have, give me just... Just a few more seconds to narrow it down. <laughs> you've had twenty. You've had over twenty four hours. I sent out the notes at like three in the oh, afternoon yesterday. Go horrible. ahead, Kronos. <laughs> this is probably the hardest one you've ever done. I think, though, mm -hmm. honestly, um, yeah. it's hard. A lot of my favorites are Final Fantasy. Like Final Fantasy is like the the RPG series that I grew up with the most. I mean, I played a ton of PlayStation One and RPGs. 
Uh, so I had to like think about it for a while, and there's still like probably six that are like the correct answer for me. Mm-hmm. But I'm I'll go with like a. Deeper I feel like cut. this is also like a when you at when. Yeah, my answer no, this, is my like answer, different based on when you ask me mm-hmm. and the mood I'm in. My <laughs> answer might change in five minutes, to be honest. Right. <laughs> um, I'll, I'm gonna go with like a deeper cut. Though. I'm gonna say Legend of Lagaya. Oh, that was that that's was, a good game. That was one of the ones I was narrowing down. Yeah. Get the hell out of here. No, the hell out of here. Whatever you said, he was gonna be like, "Oh, that was mine. Oh, I, I'm done. I'm done. I'm done." They see through my desperately plan. <laughs> Turn base Persona Three Disgay. Oh yeah, Dis- Disgaea. Disgaea is a great series. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, Tark, it's on you now. What do, or do I need to go? Do you I, still need no, a no, few no. more I, seconds? I, I'm good. I'm good. I'm All right, good. Um, I'm gonna go with Wild Arms, another deep cut. I, I love oh. that system. Um, and I hope I th- I hear that there might be making a new one so i'm really excited to see that come back to life yeah that's a little lesser known one but still good the secret of mana for baron vagamon yeah yeah secret of mana good legend of mana good too secret of evermore also kind of in that in that uh not in that same series but in that vein of of rpg i'm gonna go with lost odyssey i'll bring it a little newer tonight than you two did just to mix it up a little bit and not because Lost Odyssey is like a fantastic, you know, incredible game. It is a damn good RPG. And if you've never played it, you absolutely should. It's really fucking cheap on Steam most of the time. Ooh. Pick it up and and grab it. Uh, I believe it was originally for the Xbox 360. I think it that's was. where I played it. It was, was. It 360. Yeah. That's where I played it. And I'll tell you what. Resonance of Fate is a good game. Oh, Shadow Hearts. I mean, we didn't even bring up Shadow the Shadow Hearts. Hearts series. Yeah. Uh, anyway, uh, I'll stick one. with Lost Odyssey. It's a it's a it's a great RPG. You will enjoy it. But there are these little vignettes, man, in between things because you're an immortal that has lost your memory. And so throughout the game you are picking up people of oh, the Tales series. Yeah, I wasn't going to go with the Tales series just because I thought the Tales series would be obvious. Yeah, there's a lot of choices there. Um and they're done in like just still shot fade in fade out with text on the screen while music plays. Okay? I literally cried at like two or three of these things. I mean, it was it was just they were so emotionally well done um, that I will never forget playing through that game because there were just these stories from this immortal's life of just good things and tragedies that they have witnessed and they can't die. So they always have these memories. It was oh, beautiful. Yeah. Absolutely beautiful. That's a Sakaguchi game, right? Uh, it's one of the, one of the first it? ones since he left when he left there, Square. Right? There are definitely some I th- people I can't. I remember thought that who was, was Blue Dragon. Um, mm. oh yeah, that was Miss Walker. So that would have been Sakaguchi's company. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I know uh, Nobuo Umatsu did the the music yeah. for it, and yep. you could obviously tell if you're an Umatsu fan. But yeah, that was Miss Walker. So that would have been Sakaguchi too. Good call. Good call. That's going to do it for our show today. Let us know your favorite non-Final Fantasy uh, RPG in the comments below. Until next time, remember, no Relic Grind next week. Uh, We're taking Thursday off. No Gaming Gumbo this Saturday. So we'll have Saturday off. We'll have Thursday off. And then we'll be right back here again uh, next Saturday with Gaming Gumbo and Relic Grind the following Thursday. Until then, Kronos, where can everybody find you? Uh, yeah, same as always, Twitter. Uh, Sunday, I'll have a doubleheader of Raid and Super Bowl. So that should be interesting. Oh, mm-hmm. nice, nice. Yeah, trying to get Good further luck to your the Eagles. Yeah. Good luck to your Eagles. And uh, if, you see the, if you see the Eagles losing, do not go to Adam's Twitter. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not that angry. I probably won't be happy, though. Or- or, or or go to his Twitter to check on him. Like, hey, are you yeah. still there? <laughs> you, you are right okay? after the yeah, right well, after that pick I'm, six. I've, I've been involved in a losing Super Bowl already. I'm used to it. I was there <laughs> in 2004. It's fine. <laughs> Tarkov. Twitch, Twitter, YouTube, all the Tarkov gaming. Uh, playing uh, Omega Ultimate tonight. Uh, and I don't want you talking about football. It's been over for a while. I'm all about NBA and Durand is the sun and I'm stoked. Fantastic. I'm Mike Byrne. You can follow me right there, Magic Man One. But more importantly, follow at RC Radio R A I D E O on Twitter, and you'll know every time we go live with one of our podcasts, our streams, Final Fantasy trading card game locals, or anything else we just feel like hanging out and doing live. Until next time, stay safe. We'll see you on the servers. <laughs>